Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad that you are here, and I didn't know the the backstory of the events of this past week, other than Pastor King mentioned to me that uh, Pastor's wife was in the hospital. I have I understand why she might go to the hospital after the events of this past week. I haven't been here for quite some time, and I was re I was here way back when Pastor Wagstaff was here and uh, had some connections thinking about coming up into the pulpit this morning because a year ago, a little over a year ago, I ended up getting a broken leg. <laughs> and I was thinking about that and walking up the stairway here to get up here. Uh, remember, I thank the Lord for healing and physical therapy and everything else. <clears throat> but anyway, it's good to see you today. And I would like you to open in your, your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. And as I come and hear the events of this past week, I guess I understand why the Lord directed me to this passage. Mark chapter 4, and I want to pick it up, starting to read at verse 35. It's a, quite a familiar portion, but and it's a very brief one. But I trust this will be a, a real blessing and an enjoyment to your hearts as we look at it. I'm going to read, starting at verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep, on a pillow. And they awoke him. And said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. And said to one another, Who can this be that even wind and the sea obey him? You ever have those days where, and I full well understand that now, where, where those days where things go from being routine to getting interrupted, and can I hear everybody say, amen, amen. <laughs> you know, and one of those things, or even a little bit beyond that, a day that goes from bad to worse, again, amen, sometimes do we just assume everything's going to go well, you know, hey, I'm a Christian, so everything's going to go great for me, right? No such things as heart attacks, no such things as the events on Tuesday. It's, you know, everything's going to be a bowl, bowl of cherries, right? Years ago, I don't know if you even know this person, but a lady by the name of Irma Bombeck, she's written a lot of books. But one of them is titled, I haven't read it, I just saw the title. If life is a bowl of cherries, why am I in the pits? I think that's a very describe. I've never read the book, but or do you ever not take your normal to God? Think about that. You woke up this morning, your heart's still beating. You're still breathing. You don't even have to think about it. 
all night long. Maybe you were snoring away, but you kept breathing. Heart kept chugging along. The alarm clock goes off. You get up, ready to go. You ever thank the Lord when you open your eyes in the morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving me a good night's rest. Or sometimes some people don't rest well at night. I usually, I only remember about a handful of times that I've had real trouble sleeping at night time. My wife says, you don't know how frustrating it is <laughs> to lay there tossing and turning and hear you snoring. <laughs> Feels good to me. <laughs> but so many times, we take what we assume or have been in, uh, raised in and say, that's the way it always is. In this case, in the Gospel of Mark, verse, starting here, it's chapter 35. I want you to think about this in a very personal way. If you were one of the disciples of the Lord, and I think it's important to understand God has unique plans for each of us. Every day is not the same for everybody. He has a uniquely tailor-made plan for us as we go through this life. Notice especially here at verse 35, I want to point out some key words. It says, on the same day. Doesn't that beg a question? Same day as? What's been going on? Well, there's another phrase in there. Jesus says, let us cross over. That's a significant term. And then he says, to the other side, very to connect it together. And then there's that phrase of as he was. Puzzlements. The same day as. Well, as we think through this, if you look at the whole account, it's one of those things, if you go back to uh, verse 35, it says, on the same day, you, it, he said a full day of teaching. You look back at verse 1 of chapter 4, and again he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude. Now, I, we don't know how, how many that is. My guess is it's a few more than what we have here. But we're here, right? And they're there. A great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables, and said to them in his teaching, and then he goes on, the parable of the sower. Actually, it's, I, I don't really look at it as a parable of the sower, it's a parable of the soils. And when you look at that, it's significant. Yes, Jesus is the sower, and the seed is the word of God. But what's interesting is, as you go through the description of the soils that the seed is being laid on, there are different responses of the soils to the Word of God. And it's in the Luke account where it says, take heed how you hear. You notice what it says in verse 9 of chapter 4, Mark's rendition of that statement is, he who has ears to hear let him hear. If you are open and receptive to God's word, listen 
and take in and apply to your life. Now Luke's way of saying it was, was take care how you hear. It's a day where in verse 21, family is recorded here by Mark. Now not everything in Mark is chronological. But Mark, in presenting his message about Jesus as the servant, is picking up certain things, and in here he also mentions about how family had told Jesus, is that, you're crazy! His own brothers and sisters, you're crazy! It's amazing to think through these things. But then, notice with me, as as Jesus is speaking, go down with me at verse 34, which is just before where we started reading. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. When you go back to the parable of the sower, soils, he, ex he tells the parable. Then the disciples say, hey, explain that to me. And he spends time teaching the disciples, this is how you apply it to your life. And so when you combine the three different accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's at the end of that long day of teaching, not just the parable of the soils, but it's after those, all of those parables have been taught the disciples have drawn him aside and says, okay, I don't understand all this. So he takes time to open up the basic principles of these parables. And that's what the whole background of what's going on here. Jesus has been teaching all day long. It's coming on to evening. And he not only has taught the multitude, which wears you out, but then in the recess time alone, he says, now this is how you apply it to your life. And disciples are those good ground hearers. However, on that same day when evening had come, he said, let us cross over to the other side. Sometimes our storms, our circumstances, aren't what we would choose for ourselves. If you notice verse 37, it says, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. This parable, this account, is also talked about in Matthew and in Luke, as well as here in Mark. And the point is, the boat is getting swamped. They can't bail out fast enough. In the Matthew account, it's, it says this, it, a great windstorm, the terms used in Matthew, a mega windstorm, or a seismic windstorm. How big is that? Bigger than I want to be in the water. It says in, in Luke, then, and Mark say it's a mega whirlwind coming down. So all told, this is not a pretty picture. Even though they are, they are experienced fishermen, they start to cross the Sea of Galilee. It's about eight miles wide. They are crossing it, and then this huge storm suddenly comes up. Experienced fishermen know when to stay home and when to go out. Evening time 
being tired from a whole day of teaching and, and being explained to and helping out the crowds would have been very wearisome for them. Jesus says, okay, let's go to the other side. All right, fine, I guess. So here they go. You know, whatever wind is there. This isn't when Jesus comes walking on the water. That's a different time. But what's interesting for the disciples, they had seen, I believe this is miracle number 12, chronologically, that Jesus has done to them. They had seen the widow of Nain's son raised from the dead. They had seen the centurion servant healed simply by speaking the word. They had been by the pool of Bethsaida, Bethsaida and saw the, 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 the man raised and given strength and health. He had seen, they had seen lepers healed. They had taken in all of this and many more miracles. This was number, well, like I said, number 12. They'd seen others. It was sort of the routine. So when Jesus says, let's go to the other side, it's no big deal. So yeah, it's evening, we'll make it, and out they go. However, this mega seismic whirlwind comes down. I want to show you something here in a second. I know you can't read all of that or see all of that, but what I want you to notice is the lay of the land. Sea of Galilee is that plot of blue up in, does this have a pointer on it? Right up here. This is the Sea of Galilee, right up here. Does that, do you notice anything particular about that topographical map? It looks like it's sort of just plopped there in the middle of mountains, doesn't it? Let me show you one other slide here. This is a cross section from the Mediterranean Sea across. Now, what if this is Mediterranean Sea on this level? Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea is down here, but the Sea of Galilee is at this level. Does that say something to you? If you just think about it, the Sea of Galilee is basically 700 feet below sea level. <laughs> now, that's sort of an aside, but if the Mediterranean is at this height, what happens if you spring a lake? <laughs> if, but it's one of those things, you see there are high mountains all around the area. High mountains, low water. Mediterranean, I mean the Sea of Galilee, it's one of those things that storms come up. I think it's Mount Hermon is to the north of the Sea of Galilee. It's almost 2,000 feet. You know what happens at 2,000 feet? Around, this is a side. My son lives in Western Nevada. He has lived just outside of Denver at 12,000 feet. And uh, it's fun to go out there. Beautiful. Snow-covered mountains all around. You wear your winter jacket in the beginning of June. It's one of those things that it's height, 2,000 feet elevation, Mount Hermon has snow on top of it. And it's just one of those things where the weather phenomenon can kick up storms routinely. Even now they talk about that when there are tourists there and everything else. But 
This particular storm was a storm that was not manufactured by the weather, but it was a storm that was sent by God himself. Remember I mentioned earlier, sometime our circumstances and things we would want to choose for our lives. And we hit some mega event. Pastor and Mrs., my heart goes out to you for Tuesday event. I didn't know about that. But can you imagine how gut-wrenching that is? Turmoil. I'm sure they didn't just say, oh, well, I'm trusting the Lord, piece of cake. No. No. By the fact the police are involved and all of that, you know what's going on in their heart and soul. What could have happened? By the way, Anastasia is a great name. I was talking to her before the service. I was just last week. I, I have been three years helping the Dragon Church as an interim pastor up there. And their new pastor was installed last Saturday. Not yesterday, but a week ago Saturday. And I was there. Pastor's oldest daughter is named Anastasia. Yeah, pretty neat. I think that's neat. It's a pretty neat. Back to the point in hand here. Think about this. What do we do when mega storms come up. The disciples thought crossing the lake was going to be routine. What do you do when all of a sudden you lose your job? What do you do when all of a sudden there's a financial disaster? The car breaks down when you just have to get to somewhere. How do you handle those things? Well, often, just like the disciples, that think about that, we're perishing! Do you think they really were concerned about Jesus? Maybe you'll die? No, the emphasis is we! We're in the middle of trouble here! And here you are, sound asleep! And we do a whole bunch of things about blame shifting. We assume, don't you care about me? All the things Jesus has been doing for them is proof. Yes. Today, many people got to go have a shot of something or something like that. Kill the pain. Make it go away. You know, sometimes Jesus sends pain to us to teach us. To draw us close to himself. The world that doesn't have the Lord Jesus is so empty. It is so full of gloom and despair. We have the Lord Jesus. It's one of those things that God doesn't care. This, these, these are the apostles themselves, his disciples. And they're saying, don't you care for us? We're dying. Don't you see the circumstance we're in right now? And here you are, sound asleep in the boat. Get a pail and start bailing out. That, that wasn't in, in the scripture, you understand. <laughs> By the way, I won't, no, I won't say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we take the old story, boy, I can handle it. Yeah. You ever know people like that? Mm -hmm. It's denying reality. I can take care of this. Ignoring. Or if it's a medical issue that hits us, you know, doctor says, you got an inoperable brain tumor. I can't believe it. 
think this is happening to me. Deny it. You ever know people that, I'm sure none of you have gone through those things. But other people, their reactions. Somebody has said this, life is 10% circumstances that we can't control and 90% of life is how we respond to them. I don't know who came up with that, but it's very true. When the worst, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going type thing, you know? But in this case, how do I respond to my circumstance? My sudden circumstance, my overwhelming circumstance. How do I respond to that? Now, hang on just a second. I know this is difficult. But when I first started talking about this passage, did it ever occur to you to connect this storm on the Sea of Galilee with on the same day of verse 35? The same day of having the parable of the soils explained to you? All of a sudden you go click, 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 click. And all of the disciples' responses? Okay, you've had it all laid out for you. Nice and neat, basic principles of life. This is how you do it. But when a circumstance hits, ah! Think about that. This passage just so illustrates us, doesn't it? Don't blame Peter for being a big mouth and walking around with his foot in his mouth all the time, because we do the same thing. And when you look at this portion, the thing is, they, they did go to the right solution. They went to the Lord. But the point is, if you look at verse 38, but he was in the storm and the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose, rebuked the wind, said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? I have raised people from the dead. I have healed lepers. Blind men are seeing. Don't you think I can handle this? No, because it's hitting me hard now. That's the point. <laughs> Jesus, I mean, God the Father, threw this storm out there so that we say, ah, help. Help me to apply how what I have heard from the word to my circumstance right here, right now, that is tearing me up. It wasn't by accident. All three of the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, put this account right after the parable of the soils. Must have been a coincidence, right? No, it was a divine arrangement. How do you live out what you have over the years been told? God is in control. God is the one who has allowed this to come to you. How does God want you to respond to this circumstance? Unpackage those principles. Do you remember Jesus and the disciple says, how does this apply? It says in verse 34, he explained all things to his disciples. They had their own time out with the Lord Jesus. 
They had their own private time of instructions. This is how you do it. It's interesting when Jesus, they, uh, they woke Jesus up. All he did was stood up, looked around, says, be muzzled. Cut it out. Stop. And the wind stopped. And hang on. The waves stopped. Ever been in a boat that's rocking in the waves? You know, even after the wind goes down, they still go like this. And at this point in time, by simply saying, the Lord Jesus simply saying, cut it out. Everything became classic. That doesn't happen <laughs> in nature. Which shows Jesus is in full control of this circumstance, right? Even though it's cra crashing in on you. The boat was getting fulfilled with, when you look at the other gospel. The boat is basically ready to sink. And then this was the question I almost said. I wonder what, I, what happened. Who bailed out the water afterwards? I thought about that last night. What happened to the water that was in the boat? Probably the disciples said to doesn't say aren't you isn't it amazing what the Bible doesn't say? It's because that's irrelevant in the sense that if Jesus can calm the storm, they can fulfill their responsibilities. He provides what we need when we need it. These are seasoned fishermen. They feared exceedingly. Ah, go back one here. Notice it says there are great harm. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say it was a placid change. They feared exceedingly. They're seasoned fishermen. They're seasoned saints who know the word of the Lord can quote more verses than you and I can even begin to remember. And they panicked when trauma hit them personally. Life events push us from principle to personal. That's what, why God sent this storm. To move the disciples from simply taking in a verse a day, keep the devil away, to say, here's what you need. Here's how you really live out the Christ life. Jesus came to change life, not just give us principles. So what do what we pick up from this? We don't know why, the whys, of what's happening to us. I haven't a clue. But we know who is in charge for us. Never forget that. Our storms are tailor-made for us by a loving God. God's not being mean to us. He's a loving God. And he craves for you and me to move from simply having an itemized list of verses to practicing one or two that we know. He wants us to live out the Christ life. 
my reference in Job had to do, he was a very godly man. But you know the story. He lost his health, he lost his wealth, he lost his family. And his wife told him, oh, why don't you just curse God and die? Oh boy, isn't she a great help me? <laughs> it's one of those things where every time the devil said, hey, what about... God says, okay, but you can't go further. Oh, he's only loving you because everything is going well for him. Take his help. Okay, but that's all you can do. And you still brought a blessed God. The devil says, well, it's only because of whatever. Okay. You can do that, but don't you touch his soul. And praise God, it says, in all these things, he did not curse God. He fully trusted God. Now, he went through losing his family. He went through losing, he went through a lot of grief and sorrow <laughs> and had wonderful friends to counsel him. <laughs> you know that story. Another thing we can learn is storms come to us. Have a God, have God made limits. Very close to what I just said about Job. But 1 Corinthians 10 13 says, tells us that we are made for these things, and no temptation has taken us. That temptation can be a, translated as a seduction to do something, or it can be translated as a circumstance. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says this, No temptation has overtaken you, except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But, with the temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. Why me is often the question. I don't know. But I do, I know who knows. And the last one here is our storms are designed to drive us to expand our faith. First Peter chapter one. <laughs> one of those, you know, Peter who learned so many difficult lessons and always through the hard way. But first Peter chapter one says this. Verse six. Well, first, verse 5. We who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while. And now these next three verses. <laughs> I don't, I wish they weren't there in the Bible. No, I don't, because it's God's word. But if need B, you have been grieved by various trials. That, that's a purpose word, so that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found under the praise and the honor and the glory revelation of Jesus Christ. If need be, so that. Wow. Think about that. And then that also reminds me of the reference I simply put on the, on the slide without the words there, but in Romans chapter 5, it says this. Romans 5, therefore, excuse me, in Verse 5, it says this. 
And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces patience. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, sorry about that. And perseverance, now inferred, produces character. And character, and the word inferred, produces hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This process, tribulation, trials, testings, works patience. Patience works hope. It's one of those things there is a natural process to go through. If need be. That is quite a lesson from these few verses in Mark 4. But that's the point of the whole parable of the soils. Do you have an open and receptive mind to God's word in applying it to your present circumstance? Disciples learned a lesson. <laughs> What's interesting is with, with back there when in Mark chapter 4, for me, it's on the other page, and it's just the last verse, so then, you know, you, you almost forget to flip the page. But let me back up and read verse 40. He said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And then the last verse of the chapter, And they feared exceedingly. <laughs> they feared when the water was coming into the boat, and the wind and the waves coming over. But after Jesus instantaneously calmed everything, it says, they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Somebody, and I've seen it written on three or four different places, so I don't know who said it originally, said that, Verse 41 is the storm after the calm. <laughs> Earlier, the storm before the calm. <laughs> and this one is the, the storm after the calm. Because when they put together who Jesus is and his power and his might to work, Whoa. As a child of God, I've got all this resource for me. Hallelujah. I don't have to just say, spout off verses. I can live the verses. And aren't you glad you've got the Word of God to give this illustration for us as to when Jesus talks to his disciples, he's emphasizing I don't want you to just be able to quote verses. I want you to realize my might and my power that's in you now. And what I can do for you in your circumstance. As overwhelming as it looks, it's not too big for God. Hallelujah. What a saying. Let's pray.